Thanks, Kirsten. So I want to take you on a little bit of the adventure we're, we're doing in various types of systems biology. Um, and to sort of reinforce the idea that um, the benefits of algorithm development and the benefits of evolution is that you can develop things in one area and pivot and use them in other areas because biology really is um, effectively a unified, unified discipline and with unified principles that we can leverage for that. So in the scope of a exploding human population and a changing climate, uh, my lab is focusing on, on some areas that we think are really important for the future. Um, many of those focus around plants and microbiomes, some with a big bioenergy focus, largely a bioenergy focus um, coming out of the CBI, the Bioenergy Research Center led by Oak Ridge. Um, ways that that can be leveraged um, in the field itself, both for bioenergy crops and the lessons we learn from those can be used for precision agriculture as well. Um, and then in the end, I'll talk a little bit about how these same sorts of approaches can be used for healthcare and precision medicine. So you can imagine um, collecting lots of different data types about a species, in fact, about entire ecosystems. And, and that's what's been going on um, in a number of different species. I'll spend a lot of time talking about um, popular Strychocarpa, um, cottonwood trees. Um, these are efforts um, led originally by, by Jerry Tuscan. Um, to build these really huge resources around, around poplars of bioenergy feedstock. Um, so over the years, um, well over 1,000 now headed towards 1,500 different genotypes have been collected across the native range. Those have been completely resequenced, and that's led to about 28 million SNPs found in that population to date. That means we have a genetic marker one SNP for every 12 base pairs of genome. So pretty much marker saturation. To date, we've also collected, and this is a royal we, lots of people involved in this across many institutions, about 180,000 phenotypes across this population. This population has been arrayed in multiple common gardens in different environments, um, and phenotypes collected both molecular phenotypes and um, phenological phenotypes and collected across many, many years. We're collecting information across the omics layers, so obviously genome, transcriptome, metabolome, soon proteome, um, and in, put a meta in front of many of those. We're also doing microbiome and metagenomics analysis across this population. We also have projects involving actually every publicly avail available genome on the planet um, that we're actually using to detect microbiomes in RNA-seq data that we get of various populations. So we're, we're collecting all of this data not for the joy of, of collecting data. We're not STEM collectors. We're biologists. We want to understand the system. And we, we need to figure out how to integrate this information. With the, the large goal of being able to capture the, all the interactions, all the higher order interactions between molecules and cells, understand the molecular machinery, um, integrate that. And now we also have the ability to do um, very high throughput structure prediction in the proteome. Um, our latest estimates are we can, we can get pretty good structural models of the vast majority of the proteome of a species. That opens up all sorts of opportunities having to use this sort of data and start looking at how proteins interact, how they dock, um, and how, they, how they're interacting with metabolites or how you can potentially stabilize or perturb them with chemical compounds. So we also have libraries of about 28 million small molecule structures that we can use high throughput docking to understand potential targets of the proteins of interest coming out of any specific study. A lot of the work that's been done historically has been um, within GWAS populations, genome-wide association or QTL populations, and you can really view this as a matrix problem where the matrix on your left are your genome variants. Um, and the matrix on the right are the phenotypes you've collected across that same population. Now, traditional GWAS treats all the SNPs as independent, so in this case, you would be doing 28 million independent tests on every single genome variant against every single phenotype. And traditionally, um, when you're looking at one phenotype, you represent the results of that as a Manhattan plot, which is just the negative log transform of the p-value. Um, that's fine if you're looking at, at one thing, if, but if you're looking at 180,000 phenotypes, you really don't want to look at 180,000 180, Manhattan plots. It's not a way to, to actively integrate that information. So we're capturing that signal 
and really re we view this as statistical signal, um, we t typically capture it as networks. Now increasingly we're digging, we're digging deeper and deeper into the signal because we actually are trying to capture the right balance between type 1 and type 2 error. When you set very stringent false discovery thresholds, you're also then embracing lots of false negatives. You're leaving out lots of bio biological information. So we, we want to find the, the best of both worlds. And what we realized along the way was typically when you come up with a result, any result, as a skeptical scientist, you don't believe it, right? You go back into the lab and you design new experiments to collect more lines of evidence to support that hypothesis. To convince yourself, then to convince reviewers or a study section um, that this is a good way forward. Well, it occurred to us that all the data that's being collected across these sorts of populations are independent orthogonal experiments. And lying in all of this data, if we can integrate it, we have many, many lines of evidence supporting different sorts of hypotheses. So um, we built network layers out of um, all the sorts of data, population scale and genotype scale for different types of experiments, and written network algorithms that can um, take a question of interest and raster through the network and give you a rank order score for every gene in the genome of how relevant it is to your question. And that question can be very specific or it can be very vague. Um, one example of how we've used this is th the question was as vague as, show me new genes involved in cell wall biosynthesis or regulation. That's it, that vague. Um, so we started with that sort of query, ran the algorithm through all the networks, and, and it pops out a subnetwork of the most related genes um, to that topic of interest. Um, you have that as a subnetwork, so you have things in, co in, in context. I'm going to focus on GRF7 here at the top of this, this diagram. GRF7 comes out of a um, set of transcription factors, a transcription factor family, that are thought to be involved in growth regulation, the GR of GRF. It turns out that this one, GRF7, the paralogs A and B, um, rather than just being involved in growth regulation, actually seem to be a key regulatory circuit between how the plant responds to abiotic stress and how much carbon it pumps into its cell wall. So this is a key regulatory mechanism that we can manipulate in choices between drought stress, drought tolerance in the field, and how much of the carbon is going to go into the cell wall that we can later ha harvest as bioenergy. Because we started with these very deep data sets, we could ask this vague question and now come down to very quickly regulatory circuits that then we can go in and manipulate to generate new genotypes. So a lot of this work, as I mentioned, has been based on genome-wide associations, and these are incredibly powerful techniques. But we also know that they often explain o only a minority of the genetic signal that's present. Um, so there are a number of reasons for that, ranging from rare variants to, to a lack of perception of the, the pan genome, the importance of the exposome, the environment, gene by, gene by, gene by environment interactions, and um, very importantly, epistasis, the idea that things are actually working together. So we're transforming from this sort of traditional GWAS pipeline into one that's starting to try to capture more and more of the signal. Um, we're doing some interesting and innovative work in rare variants. Often, rare variants are statistically inconvenient, so people simply filter them out. We're building new methods that recapture that signal, um, and there's often a lot of bit, a lot of the action is in rare variants because they're typically selected against because they have such a big impact on phenotype. So we're starting to capture that signal. Um, we're looking hard at the environmental impact on the expression of a phenotype. So we, we know that, maybe the slide will change. <laughs> um, we know that the environment, that the exposome, um, has a big impact on phenotypic expression. Um, so we need a new way to look at that. So we've created this method we call genome-wide association of time series, GWATs, um, to capture both geospatial variation in the history of a species and the time series that it's ex exposed to across the year. Um, so we're collecting all the environmental and climate information we can get our hands on. We're interpolating the data so that we have daily resolution. We have daily values across the year for each one of these climate types. Um, 
you'll see different patterns of how they, how they vary across the year seasonally based on the sort of climate type you're, you're measuring at any one time. And then you can do association testing on every day of the year across this time series. Um, and when you do that, you start to see some really fascinating patterns. So here at the top is a heat map view of actually the climate type itself. So every row here is a GPS coordinate associated with where that genotype um, was collected from. So it's native environment. I mean, you're seeing how it varies across the year. And the bottom of this is, is the negative log transform of the p-value of the association test. And you see that for a good part of the year, there is no, there is no association. But, but popping up um, in the summer, you see a pretty strong signal. And this is aridity. This is how dry the environment is. Um, and it turns out that this is a gene involved in um, wax formation, the cuticle formation on the surface of the leaves, which is how the plant actually controls how much evaporation comes out of its leaves. So it's an adaptive trait for aridity, for dryness. Now, a different climate type, this case is wind stress, wind speed, um, and we see in the spring, um, there's a very strong signal that pops up in a specific SNP, and this happens to be a gene involved in leaf development. And you can imagine as your tender young leaves are coming out of the shoots in the spring, it's going to be very sensitive to wind stress, and so it's um, clearly seeing an adaptation to wind speed in the spring. Now, the exact same climate type with a different SNP has a signal in a very different part of the year. This one pops up basically in, in, um, in the middle of the winter um, after a very heavy dose of um, uh, wind change. And this is a cell wall related gene, so probably stem stress. Um, how, how, how hectically bent the tree is in, in the windstorms. Um, so the same climate type, very different association, very different adaptation at a very different time of year. So all told, so far, we've created about 28,000 of these climate types. This number is increasing. We're building more and more data sets into these. Um, and of course, we're integrating all the results of these as networks um, and build, building them into these lines of evidence methods. So this is another way to ask questions in an integrated fashion of the system and understand the historical genomic adaptations to environment, to climate type, um, and how you can interpret that in the context of all other data. Um, here, in, in this case, in the bottom is a little example of um, excuse me, a cryptochrome, which is typically thought of as a light sensor. And in fact, we do see a spectral, uh, spectral association in one part of the year. But we, we see other associations, different parts of the year, cloud density and soil water stress, that are probably related to spectral quality due to cloud cover, due to rain. But you're seeing different sorts of associations at different times of year that gives us a richer interpretation of how the plant may be using these sensors at different times of the year for different reasons. Another part of the missing signal is, is really embedded in the pan genomes. So we all know that traditionally we've been focused on reference genomes, which is just having one genotype represent an entire species. Um, but here, due to all the fantastic sequencing JJI has done, we have genome sequence for this entire population. Um, so we've been building methods to go through um, and, and build pan genomes out of this to see what signal are we missing that's not in the reference. Um, we can represent the new genes um, in their presence-absence patterns as a matrix. When we look at that as, as a bit of a heat map, we find that there are, in fact, on the right, you, um, the genes in the reference are found in most of the population, but there are presence-absence absence patterns there as, as well. And those genes that are not in the reference on the left um, have a very hectic presence-absence pattern. So these look like really adaptive signatures um, to local environmental challenges. In fact, when we do this, the reference genome has about 40,000 genes in it. In the pan genome, we found a new 25,000 genes that weren't in the reference. So that's a pretty significant portion of genomic signal that we were blind to before we started to look at the, at the pan genome. Of course, we can do association testing based on this. Um, from that presence-absence matrix, um, we're calling this NatCat for nature's collection of knockouts, association tests. Um, and the first two sets of types of data we've done that cut on is the metabolomics data that Tim Chaplinsky generated um, and some microbiome data that we've generated with Percy Busby. Um, on the top section, um, basically the, the nodes towards the top are mostly associated with the microbiome and the ones clustering in the bottom are mostly associated with the microbiome. Sorry, metabolome on top, microbiome below. And as we look through these associations, we're starting to see this adaptive range of genes moving in and out of the population that are adapting to local microbiome challenges. 
um, and we see very uh, sets of things that we expect to see associating um, with as, as defense mechanisms, as association mechanisms, and other genes that we wouldn't have thought to look for, but now we have a hint that they're involved somehow in regulating the microbiome. We can, of course, look for the intersection between genes associating with both metabolome and the microbiome. I um, mean, here we're looking at higher order salicylates as, as, as the phenotypes, as the metabolites, um, because plants use these as a very clever strategy to shape, shape their microbiome. Salicylates are poison to some microbes and food for others. So it's a very clever way to shape your neighborhood if you want to poison your enemies and feed your friends. Um, we're not suggesting that it should be a human mechanism, but plants use this very effectively. Um, and so here we have a very digestible set of genes with both associations, with specific taxa that they seem to be associating with and specific metabolites. So I call this a PhD-ready slide. Here's a thesis waiting to be, waiting to be written. Um, and it's just an example of how you can very quickly dive down from the large associations to testable hypotheses. And even better here, because these are pan genome associations, we have genotypes that we know do and don't have this gene. So the study can very quickly be done with functional genomic studies um, on contrasting genotypes um, to, to go into quite deep validation in a hurry. So I've talked quite a bit about these, the, how we're trying to capture a signal on the left side of this diagram. I'm really going to focus on epistasis for several slides here. So we know that epistasis is a phenomenon. And it comes from this idea that um, components of a biological system are not independent. They're all interacting. We know this is true in protein complexes and many other functions. You can imagine a mutation in one part of this complex by itself may not destabilize the complex. Um, but multiple mutations across in key areas of the complex will destabilize it and lead to affecting a downstream phenotype. And this is exactly the pattern we, we want to look for. And when you know it's there, you can find it. The problem is when you don't know it's there, how do you find it? Because the combinatorics are pretty amazing. In a eukaryotic cell, um, whether um, we're talking pretty much any higher eukaryote, you can do the calculation and you will see that there, the combinatorial space of a single cell is roughly 10 to the 170. For perspective, we think there are roughly 10 to the 82 atoms in the observable universe. So biology is sort of complex. I would contend that we should, if we look at a big, scary, hairy problem, we should, we should stop saying, oh my god, that's astronomical. We should say, oh, that's huge, that's biological. Um, I don't think there's more, more complexity to be found than in a biological system. So, um, but that also means we're not going to brute force this. We can't possibly look at 10 to the 170 combinations. It is computationally infeasible. With all of the supercomputers, all the computers in the world together, we couldn't touch brute forcing this. So we need to have better, clever algorithm development. So we're taking a couple different approaches to that. One is a co-evolution approach, and that's the idea that Components that are working together in a biological system tend to become a selective pressure for each other when they mutate. One SNP becomes a selective pressure for a compensatory SNP. Again, we know this is a phenomenon. We've seen this in many different systems from bacteria to plants to humans. And the trick is finding it. So, um, and we distinguish between local LD, local correlations, which is due to a lack of recombination between SNPs, versus global LD, global correlations across the entire genome. When we do this, the very first step of the algorithm uh, means we have to do somewhere between 10 to the 14th, often over 10 to the 15th of these comparisons, so the very first step. Um, that's a fair amount of compute time. Uh, and the bad news is you don't just want to do that once, you want to explore population structure to see population structure signal within that. So you may want to do this thousands of times. Um, but when you pull that off, um, we set very, very stringent thresholds of what we consider to be significant associations. So we're only keeping one out of every three million of these calculations. But the resulting topology of that network um, is how a lot of information is being stored and organized and related to each other across the genome. So the local little blobs of SNPs, the green blobs, that's local LD. Um, the longer edges are these co-evolutionary signatures marching across the genome, indicating how different parts of the biological system are working together. 
Now, because you want to do that thousand, thousands of times, this is the need for speed. Um, and we were um, fortunate to have be part of the early access um, summit science program on, on the new sum, summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge. And we're, in fact, able to, to port this over to the new feature on the GPUs that NVIDIA ship called tensor cores. Um, when they sent them to us, they were actually a little bit of a surprise. Um, and they said, we have this new feature. If you can, if you can use um, four by four matrices for matrix multiplication on mixed precision numbers, it'll be blazingly fast. We don't really know how to use it, but it will be really, really fast if you can figure it out. Um, and so we scratched our heads and, and started to figure it out. And it actually, um, once it hit, um, it made these algorithms possible in a way we hadn't dreamed of. So we're now up to 2.36 exaflops. So this is the, the largest, fastest scientific calculation ever done on the planet, ever. Um, we hold the record for the number one and the number two calculation so far. Um, and as, as Kirsten mentioned, um, we collectively, including Kirsten, who was part of this team, received the Gordon Bell Prize for this last year the first ever Gordon Bell Prize award, awarded for systems biology or genomics. Um, and we've been sort of making the argument that supercomputing is a, is a fantastic discovery engine and future for biology. And it's really nice to see the community start to recognize this. So we can take those resulting networks from this, um, use Markov clustering, spectral clustering, breadth first searches to, to create sets out of them that then we can use for set-based associations. So epistatic associations based on set-based GWAS, or what we're calling GWAS now, genome-wide epistasis. That's one method. We're also using explainable AI methods. So um, we've all heard a lot about AI. AI is fantastic at classification, finding a pattern over and over and over again. But most AI methods are absolute black boxes. They don't tell you the pattern that they're using. They're just saying, I recognize this as something that I've seen before. What we want for biology is actually the pattern that it's using for that classification. That's the molecular mechanism that we want to infer. So we want explainable methods. So in collaboration with Ben Brown's lab here at the Berkeley National Lab, we're working on explainable machine learning approaches. Um, one of them is the iterative random forest approach, um, which leverages on random forest, which has been a workhorse for machine learning for a long time, but adds a whole new way of looking at it. Um, so that the iterations, the outputs of one random force becomes the inputs for the next random force, and you keep doing this until you get convergence, until you get stability. Then you have all these decision trees that you can mine, um, and as you mine them, um, you're actually finding the interaction space. You're finding epistasis. Um, so rather than looking at one SNP at a time, we're looking for relationships of all SNPs versus a phenotype. Um, the first uh, method we've applied this to is, is looking at the metabolomus phenotypes. So we now have the epistatic network of metabolism. Um, and here we have a, a subnetwork that's, that's explaining the regulatory architecture around a metabolite um, that's actually used as a plant defense compound to shape the microbiome again. And here we see the genes involved in regulating that that we couldn't see before we had these methods. So now that we can deconvolute the system and understand how the components are interacting, we want to design new algorithms. So we're, we're developing new methods based on these that the, the outputs of, of the iterative random forest become response surfaces that we can use for phenotype optimization. So you can see the combinations of alleles that lead to um, associations of different phenotypes that you can then put into a breeding program. In fact, we can also capture the environmental information and make that part of this predictive model. In so doing, we can figure out how to design new genotypes um, that are both adapted to specific environments and have optimized phenotypes all at the same time. Because we now understand pleiotropy and epistasis all in one go. Now that we know how to do that, and are validating that in the field, wouldn't it be nice if we knew exactly where to deploy them in the world? Um, so as we speak now, um, we are busily on our next exascale project, which is an effort to take all of this climate type information and build clusters around the entire planet of all, where all these variables sit, that when we design a genotype, we know exactly where to deploy it anywhere in the world. Maybe it will change. Um, very briefly, we're taking 
Um, similar sorts of approaches for profound healthcare issues. The opioids epidemic is something that we're all very familiar with. Um, it's a very tragic epidemic ravaging the country. Um, the biological fact here is that only 10% of people who are prescribed opioids convert to addiction. From a society point of view, that's a horrible figure. From a biological point of view, that's a fascinating figure. Um, we think that's due to a very um, ancient, really, evolutionary story. Opioids are secondary metabolites in plants. Um, they're selecting for the ability um, to ward off herbivores, caterpillars, things that are eating their leaves. And it turns out it's sort of a good strategy to get your herbivore stoned. Um, if that herbivore is laying, laying in the sun, um, staring at the pretty colors and getting eaten by birds, it's not eating you. I mean, it turns out that the opioids are targeting these fundamental mechanisms that all bilateral organisms have. We are collateral damage in this evolutionary arms race between plants and insects. But it's targeting fundamental molecular mechanisms that go back to pre-Cambrian evolution. So we can start to understand the interactions between environment and epistasis to start to solve these sorts of problems. We're lucky to have a collaboration with the Veterans Administration where we have clinical records for 23 million people going back 20 years and currently about 600,000 genotypes. That number is targeted up in the one to two million range. Um, and with these partnerships and partnerships we're building for model systems to do similar population studies in Drosophila, in insects, the original targets, pumping through exactly these systems, we think we can really start to understand how these mechanisms um, have evolved and what we can do to fix some of these problems. This is never enough. We want more and more sophisticated models. We want to find the associations between everything. Um, so those become independent matrices across all omics and phenomics layers. As we add all the metadata in, they become data cubes and, in fact, arbitrary polytopes. Currently, there's no algorithm that can explore fully polytopic space. So, of course, we are creating one. We have a prototype that's up and running now that hopefully we'll be able to roll out later this year for better and better sophisticated models. What I've been saying for eukaryotes, we're now designing systems to do these in mi microbes and microbiomes as well. Um, and we're starting to do this, this reach and multi-scale modeling from individual nucleotide resolution and genomes up to ecosystems, climate, and it, even astrophysical phenotypes, because light is coming from our nearest star, right? Um, so if you want multi-scale modeling, we're, we're bridging across a few different regions here. Um, Big shout outs to lots of different funding sources. Um, obviously, a huge shout out to JGI for all the work that's gone into sequencing these populations. The folks who have been working on these for years, Jerry Tuscan, Jay Chen, Wellington Machero, Tim Chaplinsky, uh, Steve DeFazio, lots of, this has been a huge collaborative effort over many, many years. Um, my jail comes to bio team, Wayne Gilbert, OLCF. And with that, I can take questions. I understand. Oh, I got no, I got distracted. I <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, so I think we have time for one question, if there's a quick one, before we can move on to the next one. Right. Okay. Okay.